emerging threats to online freedom and prospective opportunities to transnational commitment, are we prepared for the evolving future? Through Internet's interconnectivity and openness, innovation has flourished. But how do we deal with new challenges such as transfer of data and the handling of metadata? How can we share experiences and good practices on Internet freedom for global development in order to prepare our societies for the evolving future, where new threats to openness will continue to emerge? Do we need a contingency plan? Good afternoon, Hey, my name is Erwin Zerf. Jag beklagar att jag inte talar svenska. So you're going to have to put up with uh, Vince Surf speaking in English. First of all, I wish that I could be with you for this wonderful conference on internet freedom, uh, to say nothing of the fact that Stockholm is one of my favorite cities. Uh, but uh, I can't make it, so uh, you'll have to put up with this uh, video greeting instead. Uh, first of all, there could not be a more important subject now than maintaining the freedom and openness of the Internet. There's no question that those elements have made this a gigantic economic engine, to say nothing of the fact that it has opened up democratic processes in places where uh, they were not in the past. Voices that could never have been heard are now made audible. Uh, scenes that could not be seen are now made visible. I can't imagine anything more important than continuing this multi-stakeholder dialogue uh, which this Freedom Day uh, will be exhibiting. That dialogue needs to be continued in the Internet Governance Forum and in other fora around the world in order to assure that governments that are concerned about the use of the Internet and the misuse of the Internet don't, uh, in their zeal to protect their populations, seriously harm the openness of the internet which is given it uh, and given us so much benefit so i hope that you'll succeed in articulating these issues very clearly and loudly uh, and that you will continue to propagate those in places where these messages need to be heard in the meantime i hope i'll have the opportunity to see you on the net Welcome back from lunch, ladies and gentlemen, and congratulations for staying with the program to the last session, uh, which, um, which deserves praise. Um, this session is going to be forward-looking. We're looking at emerging threats to online freedom and prospective opportunities as well to transnational commitment. And on our panel today, I have here Anja Kovac, a project director of, for Internet Democracy Project based in India, Mr. John Morrison, the Executive Director of the Institute for Human Rights and Business. On my left is Richard Allen, Director of Public Policy in Europe, Middle East and Africa for Facebook. Sarah McCune is a Senior Researcher at Citizen Lab at the University of Toronto in Canada. And Lee Hibbard is from the Council of Europe, where he is the coordinator on internet governance. So welcome to all the panel, and welcome to our Twitter feed, our online curators, and to all of you. I hope that this session, being the last, not just of today, but of the conference, we can all reflect together on what we've heard so far and our own views about emerging threats and opportunities uh, for uh, freedom and openness on the internet. Richard Allen from Facebook, can I start with you? So Facebook's users, and I'm, every time I do this, you tell me I'm out of date. So according to Facebook, <laughs> yeah. Facebook's user base is 845 million as of December 2011. That's correct. Uh, one thing about going through an IPO process is more data comes out oh, more I frequently. So. Okay, so that is correct. and. Just a measure of the, this isn't just 845 million people who signed up once and then went away. About half of those people are going online every day. And, and those are active users, they've logged on at least once in the last 30 days. Yes, so that, if we're looking in terms of world populations, we've got China, India, Facebook, would that be? 
In numbers, yeah. In numbers, yes. Obviously, very different relationships. But we've spoken a lot, haven't we, over the last few days about the differences between authoritarian regimes and democracies in that whereas democracies might want to know information about their citizens, they are subject to what, the rules of law, checks and balances. My question to you is, what checks and balances are there for not just Mark Zuckerberg, but for Facebook as a corporation, for, Go for the Googles, for the, these, these organizations which are becoming increasingly concentrated, increasingly powerful, hold absolute gold mines of data. Can we trust you? I mean, I think, Emily, I, th I think it's always wrong to think of large internet services as somehow being outside jurisdiction. Uh, the way I think of them, I think more accurately, is that they're like uh, offshore islands from a particular jurisdiction. And that can be any jurisdiction around the world. A lot of them are offshore islands of California uh, because of the strength of Silicon Valley. But actually, web services are set up around the world, hosted and governed by the jurisdiction of their host country. Uh -huh. um, and in fact, some, in terms of the emerging threats, a lot of the decisions we have to, I think, take over the next few years around whether that model uh, can be sustained, where essentially uh, the island exists, people from all around the world can visit that island, and when they're visiting, they're effectively subject to the jurisdiction of the home country, the rules of the service, but those rules of the service are framed within the legal framework that applies mm. to that service. Or whether you need to do one of two other things, one would be to effectively divide the island up so that visitors from different countries get a different view of it, uh, or to try and get some kind of common denominator rule, some international rule of law that would apply in mm -hmm. place of domestic law. Mm -hmm. And those really seem to me the, the kind of three options. But, but they, you know, the idea that we exist outside jurisdiction, I think, is, is like a non-starter. No, yeah. I think that the, the point really is, you know, um, I don't know if you agree with this statement, but I believe that Mark Zuckerberg has made statements to the effect that pri privacy, or privacy if you're American, is an outdated concept, that we'll have to all get used to not having it, or that it, it, isn't it funny how all these people trust me? And you know, it's actually more about the impact of spending so much time in an environment where the norms and the, if you like, the rules of the road are defined by a corporation and not subject to the normal accountability mechanisms of a, of a country. I, I mean, yeah, I, I would contest that. that, that I mean, there is, a, there is a legal framework that applies to all aspects, but there's also... D a, but do a you, kind of a, do you no, agree no, that privacy is an outdated concept? Uh, no, I think there's, there's a very immediate accountability, which is people choose to use internet services or not to use internet services depending on whether they deliver what that individual wants. We've created a service that allows people to create a set of connections and share stuff with them. Uh, and that's enabled by the fact we have the internet and we have you know, things like our digital capture devices that we all carry in our pockets to take photos. Uh, so we can capture data and we can share it. Uh, we've created a service that allows people to do that. Now, by definition, more people are capturing more data and sharing it more frequently than they were before these technologies existed. Uh, you know, I mean, that's the observation that Mark was making, and I, I, I would contest with anyone in this room to say that it is untrue that more people are sharing more data more frequently now that we have captured devices and the internet. Yeah. Thank you. Lee Hibbard from the Council of Europe. Do you buy that? <laughs> no, I think that... Uh, <coughs> buy that. I think that um, uh, this, whole, this whole conference, Internet Freedom, is about a celebration of freedom. And, and Facebook is one good example of that freedom to associate, to assemble, to express yourselves. But of course, you said it, trust. You said it, influence, power. Uh, it's a very powerful space because people are, are talking, they're communicating, the question of privacy, expression, it's all there. So going straight from, I mean, this is not about Facebook, but going straight to the question of human rights and applicable, enforceable rights and the Convention on Human Rights in the European space, for example, what does that mean? Uh, just a, hy a hypothetical example. If, for example, a country, um, a, a good proportion of its population was using a social networking site, and that's what they were only using, particularly young people, um, but there was an abuse of, let's say, Article 8, the, you know, the right to private life, data was you know, being abused in that sense, um, and it kept being abused, and the state <coughs> knew that, then you could eventually have a case become before the Court of Human Rights against the state, regarding uh, the right, the, a violation of the right to private life. So uh, that's how important I think uh, these spaces can be. I mean, it, the case is not here yet, but uh, you know, in the future, who knows? I mean, 
the notion of privacy is one thing and the global notion of privacy is one thing, but in terms of pure human rights, what does that mean regarding that right? That has to be worked out. And so, therefore, the state has a very important role in engaging with companies to make sure that they work that out together. So, you would, I suppose, disagree with the proposition made by Monsadler yesterday that, that you know, the, the sort of the data or that was captured by CCTV cameras and could it all just be put into a huge, great big, large public domain. You know, we, and it's an interesting point, isn't it, that when we talk about freedom, it means slightly different things to all of us. And, and you, or rather the Council of Europe, would very much see a strong personal privacy as part and parcel of internet freedom. I mean, it's there, there's case law which talks about the more you increase your, the, a state's use of technology and its services, and, and, and particularly services which are very important, um, the more there's a need to take care that they respect human rights, particularly those rights in the European context regarding the Convention. So it is there. Uh, it's yet to be tested properly, I think, but the case law is coming. But, you know, we really have to understand that this, you know, rights just don't go away because, uh, you know, you know we're, we're sharing data. You know, our phone, we're, we're all pushed we're all encouraged to share data because machines, camera, phones are all like that. It's all about and, that. And we like it. And we like it. We love course. it, don't we? Yes. You know. But yes. states uh, have signed a convention. They've signed up to the Euro Universal Declaration of Human Rights, for example. You know, what does that mean? Yes. John Morrison. We heard this morning in the, in the sessions before lunch about the very uncomfortable and challenging ethical questions that many businesses have, not just in selling kit and equipment to um, authoritarian regimes, but also in operating in those countries. Um, and we also heard about the experiences of Vodafone, we heard about the initiatives taking place for telcos within the EU. But I wonder whether we're making life more difficult for ourselves than we need to. And um, are there any examples, there must be examples from other environments where these challenges have been faced by industry. Can you give us any, any insight into that? It's a really interesting question as to how exceptional the sector is in terms of the dilemmas it faces and, and how many are actually common to business sectors writ large. Uh, we're doing some work for the European Commission at the moment to develop human rights guidance for the ICT sector as a multi-stakeholder process, but we're also doing it for the oil and gas sector and the recruitment industry. And actually, the commonalities of methodology and substance will become clear as the year goes on. And I urge all of you um, in the room to, 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 to contribute ideas to, to our process. But the ex let's just take the exceptionalist case. Um, if this was 1948 and Eleanor Roosevelt was here, you know, announcing the Universal Declaration of Human Rights into the room, would she men mention the internet because it's such an enabling technology for human rights writ large? She might. In her speech, she mentioned human rights on the farm, the factory, and the office. I'm sure she would have mentioned human uh, in the internet in her speech, <laughs> I I even if it wasn't in the UDHR itself. So there is an exceptionalist case about the technology, and I think this idea of this island and the rules and the multi-stakeholder processes we go through to, to create those rules is important. But I do think it's overstated. So if I'm, if, I'm, if I'm putting it on the scales, I'm sort of 70, 30. And I think 70, actually, some of the, the really gritty issues are issues that other businesses face. So if you're a, a mobile operator in a country that doesn't respect human rights, and you're sign, signing a joint venture agreement with the state-owned company, other industries signed joint venture agreements. So the question around how you integrate human rights due diligence into joint venture negotiations is not something for the sector alone. Um, and I think the more, the more we look at these relationships, government to business and business and business relationships, particularly when we look at supply chain, but not just supply chain, there's a lot more commonality than is stated at events like this. Mm. That's quite a heretical view, you know I that. Know. I'm probably going to get lynched now. <laughs> That's okay. the one. I'm a dead man. Um, Anja Kovac, we, we were talking uh, earlier about, you know, the, this sort of, uh, um, you know, the, the role of states, hmm. the role of companies, and earlier sessions yesterday talked about the sort of, there are shifting, shifting powers, shift, hmm. the, 
that the powers are, are shifting in weird ways, not just by geographical, regional, stakeholder group. This sort of, um, what do you see from where you're sitting, uh, looking at democracy and and with regard to the internet and freedom? What are the trends that that you regard as opportunities or as threats mm. in in the dialogue about these? I think increasingly for us, it's um, really problematic to see all over the world, that uh, um, both businesses and civil society give more and more legitimacy, legitimacy to the argument of uh, sovereignty of states, for states to be able to legislate over the internet, even if it's very clear that that legislation in many cases harms the internet. Um, for one thing, I think we've been talking a lot here about the rule of law, but I think even in a lot of democratic countries, the rule of law is actually not all that strong. Um, and where it is strong, it's often strong to protect the state. So what you actually get is a situation where the rule of law is used to undermine the potential of the internet. So I think we need to move out of that mm. dichotomy between democratic and authoritarian societies, because in, especially in many developing countries, the situation is much more complex. And sometimes that also comes not necessarily out of ill will, though I think we need to be realistic about that as well, but I also think there are sometimes cultural factors in place. So, for example, in India, there is a fairly strong censorship regime which has actually a fair amount of social acceptance because it's seen as a way to deal with social conflict in the country, with the fact that there's so much diversity, mm -hmm. people are likely to disagree, there are certain sensitiv sensitivities which the government wants to keep in check. And there is a fair amount of, especially around religion, uh, social acceptance for that. So you had a pre-internet censorship regime that was about control, that's not really working in the internet age that is causing a certain amount of problems. So you see a government there grappling by trying to reimpose that old framework. I, but governments I, do that, don't they? I mean, the governments, the, we, there is an uncomfortable hmm. truth there, which is that governments do have the right to legislate for their own uh, sovereign territory. And, uh, you know, nobody's going to be able to take that away. Hmm. So how do they do these things? And and. Uh, the internet, which primarily exists through private law contracts mm. and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, ra uh, in a regime that can't mm. possibly aim to compete with the legitimacy of sovereign nations, how do you how do you resolve that? See, I'm obviously I'm speaking from a civil society perspective, so um, it's not. I don't want to say that we shouldn't recognize the sovereignty of states because I'm quite sure that I would never be invited to sit here again, but, <laughs> and also not get very far in advocacy. But I do think, from the perspective of business and civil society, it's really important to push back, right, and to continue to adhere to the narrative of a free, open, global internet. Mm. So you're saying we are unquestioning, unquestioningly yes. accepting yes. this as a truth yes. without saying, uh, but hang on. And asking questions about, but if you as a democratic society especially, if you also say the global free open internet matters, then we have to measure what your policies do to that internet. And in more and more okay. countries, those policies are harming mm -hmm. the global free and open internet. So I think we need to shift back a little bit again and kind of try and refocus the discussion. I mean, we do need to deal with those concerns, but I think in a slightly different manner. Thank you. Sarah McCune, from the perspective of civil society and looking forward to the threats and the opportunities and also thinking about the points that Anya has made about the role of civil society in advocating, what particular opportunities or threats do you see with regard to internet freedom from where you're sitting? Well, Citizen Lab has been researching and documenting the cyber threat landscape from the civil society perspective for a number of years now, and we've seen uh, a vast increase in the array of cyber threats that civil society organizations face at the same time that civil society groups are trying to you know, increase their activity levels and become more effective with limited resources. And these threats include everything from internet censorship and filtering, electronic surveillance, um, denial of service attacks, website defacements, and cyber espionage, including um, 
espionage that's uh, facilitated through targeted malware attacks. So you're saying that civil society groups themselves are sustaining attacks, whether it's you know online. The source of the attacks is known? Is it unknown? Does it vary? Well, we've talked a little bit um, already a little but in uh, some of the earlier sessions, the issue of attribution, it's a very hard, mm. complex issue. Um, we've done quite a bit of technical forensics on some of the malware samples that we've looked at. And a lot of times, the, uh, the farthest you can get is tracing down a command and control server in a particular location. But of course, that particular computer, that server, could be controlled from another location entirely. So it's a difficult issue. Although at the same time, uh, the location of that server has um, a, a lot of bearing on the responsibility of the state in which it's housed in yes. terms of making sure that uh, there's some accountability there. And I guess we see in that story itself the uncomfortable sort of <laughs> the uncomfortable sides of the same thing, which is that I'm sure as civil society that there, would, there is a legitimate um, expectation in some cases for anonymity, for uh, untraceability, but there, these very civil society groups are also sustaining attacks and you don't know where they're coming from. Well, you, you can you can make certain conclusions about where they're coming from based on the timing, based on the social engineering employed to deliver the malware, um, you know, the, the technical forensics uh, yes. that concern the command and control servers, IP addresses and what have you. But the cyber threat landscape is really changing very rapidly and it's extremely hard for civil society organizations to keep up. I mean, right now we're seeing there's a very low barrier to entry uh, when it comes to attackers, you can purchase malware um, sort of off the shelf um, in underground forums uh, mm -hmm. and launch that malware on your own in initiative. Um, there's also more and more advanced social mm -hmm. engineering um, uh, with spear phishing emails. Um, it's getting better and better, less and less misspellings <laughs> mm -hmm. um, to try to induce a recipient to open a malicious attachment or click on a malicious link. And it's very adaptable. It's adapted to social media like Facebook, um, to Twitter. Um, and one example that uh, Citizen Lab has been working on, uh, t the Tibetan community has been under this threat for quite some time, and it's intensified. Uh, you may be aware that there have been a number of self-immolations in uh, the Tibetan areas since 2009. There have been over 30 self-immolations. Some yesterday as well. And uh, in response to that, we've seen an, an actual increase in malware that employs social engineering referencing self-immolations, referencing um, protests having to do with such, such activity, and really drawing on that to induce people to um, infect themselves. And uh, on top of that, we've also seen incidents of uh, Twitter hashtags related to Tibet being flooded with uh, uh, just all kinds of, you know, botnet um, instigated. I actually think we saw feeds. some, yes. some yesterday, yes. didn't yeah. we? Which, which we did. probably some measure of the um, popularity <laughs> of the, of the hashtags <laughs> from this conference, and that, that sort of leads us into our online curators, guys. Um, how's it going on Twitter? Is there anything that's bubbling up through that? Um, yeah, I think people are quite concerned about the, the. Um, the distance between civil society and governments still it's the same discussion that we have had all the uh, th throughout the conference basically mm. any solutions <laughs> no not really no. <laughs> well i do have a but comment I mean, on that yeah yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> would you let's sh should we just see d does anybody from the audience want to take the floor for a, a minute should we should we hear from from John and from Sarah first, but please think about your questions. I'm going to come to the audience just after we've had these two comments. John. It's the, uh, this issue about the distance between civil society and governments, and I, I accept it, and I'm learning about it. I'm relatively new to the ICT sector. But if, if you're talking about most other sectors, a multi-stakeholder approach means government sitting at the table too. And there is a curious thing in this sector, a libertarian, a very strong libertarian streak, which I admire, but at some point of time, everyone's going to sit around a table and talk about the rules. And that's, and, and that's got to include the Russians and the Chinese and everybody yeah. else. And that's got to happen sometime. And um, it's the question yesterday, and I remember Dan from the State Department saying, 
well, you know, we don't have governments in, in GNI, for example, because governments are the problem. Well, actually, governments are the problem on a lot of human rights issues, not just this sector. Um, and it's because of that we've had to develop all these uh, other mechanisms of governance to address some of that. And so governance, uh, governments are the problem on a lot of issues, mm. not but just But it doesn't this one. mean we shouldn't talk to them. We need to find ways of engaging with yeah. them. Sarah? I completely agree with that. We definitely need to engage governments on this issue. But I think it does that engagement does need to incorporate the civil society perspective. Oh, yeah. And right now, civil society urgently needs a better infrastructure of support on cybersecurity. Uh, they can't continue to sustain these attacks without a severe impact on their ability to um, implement their own human rights program agenda. And uh, so that support needs to come in a variety of forms. It needs to be political support um, in terms of actually reiterating to governments, governments on behalf of civil society or organizations, reiterating to governments that those kind of attacks against civilian institutions are inappropriate. We've talked quite a bit about confidence building measures and actually demarcating our red lines of appropriate behavior. And I think speaking out on behalf of civil society organizations is important in that respect. Uh, we also need more um, research and data that's civil society oriented that also respects ethical and policy issues. And we need better exchange between technologists and human rights advocates. Um, I think the funding that's gone on in that regard um, for online freedom has been great, but it's only one part of the equation. We also need to um, facilitate that exchange, recognizing mm. the different perspectives that are brought to the table there. Mm. Thank you. Lee Hibbard from the Council of Europe. Any questions from the audience first? Could okay, I'll come to you after Lee. I'd and then I, um, my own personal experience in the Council of Europe is that um, governments are becoming much more close to civil society. I don't agree. I mean, it depends where you are, which space you're in, but um, we're, we're doing a lot to um, you know, bridge and create spaces for dialogue, whether that be formal spaces, formal structures, or clouds of people around formal structures discussing common issues. So one of the brand new things which is coming through, at least in the work of the Council, is the idea that um, you know everyone has a voice? It's, it's there's an open and inclusive attitude towards internet policy, policy making. Would that be human rights uh, policy making or, or, or other, even if it's rule of law questions? And so it's it's quite clear there. For, at least for me and the council, there's a change. And we a few weeks ago we had a, uh, we the, the 47 member states adopted an internet governance strategy, which is. Uh, packages together over 40 actions on different different issues like children, human rights, uh, cybercrime, these issues. And and in there, there is an explicit reference to the importance of multi-stakeholder dialogue, that that is key for future policy making. So it's incumbent on us to make sure that the civil society is included, also businesses too. And that's the next steps for, for us. And we saw that, of course, in the OECD, um, whatever it is, statement, <laughs> resolution, rules last summer. Madam, you have a question. Do you have a microphone yet? Can we get oh. a microphone? Okay. Thank you. Please, can you introduce yourself? Uh, I'm Jiren Prem Shaiphan from Thailand. I would like to, like, uh, I, I, I quite agree with Sarah. Once when you talk about, like, uh, the civil society need a kind of, like, uh, the cyber security training, but I would like to, like, uh, we should, like, uh, identify more who, when we talk about the civil society, in terms of internet freedom, probably it doesn't mean just only NGO. It should come to the people, come to like uh, the netizen and net activists. So I think like uh, probably we need a kind of like a broader uh, definition for for this group that need to be protected. Um, we enjoy oh. once when we can like uh, engage more or expose more in the serve the internet. Like uh, we, we feel like like to share photo, like to share everything. Um, I, I agree with some kind of like uh, the, the thing that's already tweeted about like uh, these kinds of things should not take away our human rights protection mm. as well. We still need that. And so I, I would like to know how, how do we can like uh, in the past one when we talk about the, we serve the internet, we're looking for the service that like a uh, user friendly service. Right? And I don't know, right now we didn't probably hear more about like a user friendly service much, but I would like to hear more about like uh, the protection user service. I think probably how, instead of like uh, try to make the people have to learn how to protect themselves, that's quite complicated, quite difficult for the general public. 
how the service will provide some kind like uh, the safeguard and the measurement that ensure that the user can be protected. Thank, Thank you. you. Richard Allen of Facebook, would you like to, to take that question and then I'll... Yeah. And to pick that, it's actually an extending Anya's point, which I thought was very well made about when you're approaching governments, we need to be realistic that inside most governments there's a battle going on. And when I think pretty much everybody in this room, uh, who's from whether from civil society or internet companies, is on the revolutionary side of that battle against what are conservative forces within government. Uh, and so typically governments ha have a faction, uh, often folks around the security agenda, who are very concerned about the internet, very worried about the internet, and we're a bunch of people who are turning up and saying, <laughs> you, you know, put your worries to one side because this thing is so important, let's, let's, let's have the revolution, let's take the risk that if people do speak freely, you know, our society won't collapse. Um, and so when we're doing that, it's a very tense and, and kind mm. of challenging discussion. I think particularly, in, you know, again, when we look at security technologies, which is a, a really important point to make, as internet companies, we will do things like put SSL technology in so that the connections are encrypted. Uh, we'll put in place a whole load of security measures, which are great for protecting our users, but in some cases, they're protecting our users from snooping by their own governments. And how do governments react to that? Again, it's a revolutionary kind of challenge to their authority. And they will react then by creating legislation that says, okay, we now can't read the stuff off the telecoms wires, so you've got to give it to us directly. Um, so, so there's a kind of escalation there that, that is unfortunate. Mm -hmm. So I, I absolutely agree, we need to put in place the security measures. We do, we build them up. But unless you answer the governmental problem, all you're doing is kind of ratcheting up to the next level. You haven't actually um, won the battle uh, of the revolutionaries against the conservatives. Mm. Anja Kovac. I actually wanted to come back to the question of civil society and government. Yes. And maybe also taking off from Jiu's point about we need a broader coalition of like what is civil society. Um, I mean, when I said earlier we need to step back and talk more about the global free internet, it also means that as civil society we need a much stronger transnational uh, linkage. And I think many of us don't have this kind of spaces that, that Lee was talking about. Um, historically, these things just haven't evolved. In quite a few countries, what you see is that actually most internet activists are constantly responding to new initiatives by governments. So they're constantly running mm. after what the government is doing and focusing very much on that national context. And the point of the question, I think, was quite interesting that there's organized civil society and then there's the citizen yeah. and, and perhaps social networks and, and other of these sort of crazy, semi-chaotic kind of, not, not that social networks are crazy, Crazy, or that people on them are crazy, but it's just that this is this is something new that we're seeing. This is you know these these but sort of the problem in many developing countries is also that user movements are still far less developed, and developing a user movement is a really really. Uh, labor and time and resource intensive affair. So partly because the internet is fairly elite, there are many people who don't care. And amongst those who care, there will be a fair number who have a stake in, um, they're part of the elite, so they have a stake in the status quo. And I think all these things also come together um, in many developing countries to make those few internet activists fairly isolated who seem really libertarian. Again, I guess similar to the experience of Facebook where people are like, what are you guys exactly trying to do? Mm. Um, so we need much more, I think, transnational coalition building to be able to change those things slowly. Thank you. I have a question over here. Can we get a microphone to... Have you got a microphone yet? A yes, good. I have a microphone. So I'm uh, Ricky Frank Jorgensen from the Danish Human Rights Institute. Uh, thank you for a very interesting discussion. I think one of the main challenges uh, we are facing, both at national but also at international level, is that the topics we're discussing at this conference are um, in many cases uh, being debated and advocated in very separate clusters. So we have one cluster of people around a net freedom uh, agenda, and we have a cybersecurity agenda, for instance, that those are completely different people and often these different groups don't interact. We have the privacy community, which again is another cluster. We have the CSR people. And I mean, until we get some of these debates united within a common framework where we actually have the various um, and very real um, conflicts of interest facing one another and I mean we can't discuss freedom of expression and internet freedom without having the privacy discussion not in a different panel but I mean we need to bring <laughs> these interests together 
Yes, I, I can see a lot of nods from the panel. <laughs> I'm, going, Thank you. I'm going to go to John Morrison and then Lee Hibbard to respond to that question. And it's, it's a rhetorical question a little bit. Um, the development minister yesterday compared the internet with water. A very interesting comparison. And what's interesting about water is it became a human right two years ago, right? The right to water and sanitation. It's not as if human rights are a fixed concept. I'd love if Frank is still in the room to get a percentage odds of access to internet becoming a human rights in any of our lifetime. But if it did, or even the debate to tr around that would bring some, the, what Rike said, I think would bring some of these disparate voices together. To, to, it's not me. I don't know. Um, you know, I mean, there'll come a point in the next 10 years that there'll be more people with access to the internet, perhaps, than access to adequate sanitation. And adequate sanitation is a human right, and access to the internet is not. So, <laughs> what, what do we do? I mean, it took a 10-year process to get water and, and sanitation mm. as a human right, but it forced everyone to put their cards on the table. Um, I just wonder if it's an endeavour we should even consider yes. in this arena. Well, why don't we ask the audience, who here thinks that access to the internet should be a human right? Can you put up your hand if you think it should be? There you go. Got a few supporters. Not before sanitation. It's already a human right, sanitation. It's got to be realised, yeah. It's got to mm. be realised. Yeah. But I wouldn't call that an overwhelming majority, no. would you? And I, I'd have thought we're I'm probably int quite into the internet in this in this room. But then Lee you're, Hibbard. Yeah, but then you're then you're renegotiating treaties, and I don't think that's necessarily a good no, idea well, like either. Not. Either. So I, I prefer to see it as inextricably linked with uh, the right to freedom of expression, rather, in that context. A bit like uh, we we're talking about internet freedom, like press freedom in the 1960s has become a corollary of, of, of freedom of expression. So it's as, as strong and as protected now as, as freedom of expression. So internet freedom, perhaps in the near future, will have the same sort of uh, protection. But I would say, just to respond to the question, Emily, that um, mm. I think it is pretty much, in, in response to Ricky's uh, question, it is a bit divide and rule. I mean, in the sense, of, uh, across these spaces. And until we get our act together, you know, we consolidate, you know, how, how coherent and how effective can we be? I mean, uh, I'll, be, I'll, 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 put, I'll put my uh, foot to the metal and say that that divide and rule allows, let's say, businesses to exploit gaps and to do what they want to do. Because if there's no coherent res response, they just carry on doing their own business model, which is to make money. And that's fair enough. But So we have to get ha ha our house in order. And how do we do that? Richard Allen from Facebook, how are you going to uh, <laughs> respond to this? Uh, I see. Uh, well, I'd, um I just want to pick up on that point, and, and, yeah. and I think the two are the same. Actually, it's um, th there is a a point we can get to, which is a a settled legal framework, and it has to be a legal framework around things like uh, what is an appropriate level of monitoring and interception of communications in a in a country. And and you're right. I think we absolutely have to get there as as a citizen, thinking from a citizen's point of view. I want the freedom to use the internet as I want to use it, but I do also. Uh, support the security services in my country keeping me safe and I understand and recognize that there are certain things that they have to do in order to do that and I want to be part of a open transparent democratic debate that arrives at that point that says this amount of monitoring is okay uh, and and I think there is a problem at the moment the two communities are c kind of shouting at each other one community says you know give me everything and the other community says you can have nothing uh, and, and it's much harder to get to the point of deciding what the right amount is Thank you. I'm going to go to the online curator. Are there any questions coming up from the audience or from the Twitter feed? Yeah, actually, um, I'm trying to to collect questions uh, to one here. And uh, basically, when it comes to to sharing or transparency, and this is uh, directed directed both to governments and uh, businesses, there's no real need to um, exclude the questions of privacy. That's the, that, that's like the main question on Twitter for a moment, and how how to deal with that when when for instance Facebook is actually uh, setting terms of uh, of service which are not democratically settled. settled. I see. Um, I'm going to go to Sarah. Would you like to to respond to those questions, uh, Sarah McCune? Well, broadly speaking, I think it's also. Um, a mistake to focus only on uh, the distinct interests of the different groups, government, private sector, and civil society. I think there are also a lot of commonalities there that can be recognized. Um, I think privacy by design 
um, is one initiative of the private sector that's in the civil society's interest, but also in the interest of um, innovative businesses that want to create new models that will mm -hmm. generate more profit. Um, that's one, one uh, example. On the cybersecurity side and concerning cyber threats, uh, we've seen at Citizen Lab that many times um, civil society organizations that have been compromised by, by a certain targeted malware campaign, when we trace that campaign back to the server and analyze the technical forensics, there's also instances of collateral compromise. That same campaign that's targeting civil society groups is also targeting um, a number of high value targets, including governments, international organizations, and the like. So I think there's a lot of area, areas where we can develop our common interests and try to push forward a better framework for cooperation. And, and surely if those, if those common interests are expressed through multiple different stakeholders, it's, it's all the stronger and all the more compelling. I have a question in the audience over there. Thanks for your patience, sir. Robert, oh. sorry, there we go. Uh, Robert Bull with the Broadcasting Board of Governors in the United States. One of the, um, as a news publishing organization, as a large news publishing organization, one of our jobs is to explain the news to people in multiple markets. And so we take very complex issues and try to render them in ways that people can access them. So I'm wondering what, and, and I think we kind of hit on this issue, but sort of veered away from it, is the role of ICT as well as government to not only just inform people of issues of privacy, but to instruct them and to provide a much more proactive role of creating more publics around these issues. It seems a lot of the conversation, which makes sense since we're, a lot of us are activists and governments in the room, are about how do we do better ourselves. The question really is how do we do better for the ultimate citizen? Thank you very much. Lee Hibbard, yeah. Council of Europe. Uh, I mean, we've, uh, a few weeks ago, there was a, we, the, the 47 countries adopted a soft policy instrument on human rights and social networks and also on search. And um, it's, a, it's a text which is destined for governments, which they've agreed to, about these issues. I'm actually, you know, actually, how do you implement these, these questions of privacy and whatever else? But there is a breakdown because um, it depends on companies respecting human rights. So how do you bring uh, companies to the table willingly wanted to play ball in spaces uh, with governments on questions about you know, privacy, informing users, giving them the power to do things, giving them right, connecting their rights to, their, to national mechanisms for complaints or so, uh, seeking a right to reply, these sorts of things. How do you get them to the table? And that connection, in co it, it's, mm. a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's by their own volition. That's a bit of a breakdown. So it depends upon context. So. John Morrison, how do you get businesses to the table well, to I, talk about I human rights? I do what rights? the United Nations and the OECD have done. I mean, fundamentally, is, 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 is tell businesses that they have a direct responsibility and codify that, begin to codify that in laws. So the Council of Europe needs to align itself with, with, with the merged UN standards here, as the OECD has already done. And then I think that will help mm. the process. Anja Kovac? I think just one thing that would really help in terms of pushing the public debate is you know, uh, Sarah was mentioning how innovative businesses might have more interests um, aligned with civil society than we're thinking right now. So if we have one business that managed to establish itself and actually has a real example in terms of terms of conditions, privacy, etc., I think that would immediately change the field quite a lot because I'm quite sure that all other businesses would be forced to follow suit. So it's... Uh, if anybody here is interested, I think there's a real opportunity there. <laughs> Richard Allen, do you, are you interested? Uh, always <laughs> interested. Um, I, I just want to, want to pick up one point out of uh, what Lee said, which is, you know, businesses are at the table. Um, we are regulated businesses. Uh, we, at the end of last year, uh, uh, had, and it's all in the public domain, a lengthy investigation by the US Federal Trade Commission and a lengthy audit by the Irish Data Protection Commissioner. And out of that have come recommendations and commitments that we have to make. Uh, and actually, in the case of the Irish report, we volunteered that that could be published in its entirety to, to further the public debate. So I think it's a, mis a mistake to think that we're not at the table and we're not 
being scrutinized. Um, the question is, you know, are we moving far and fast enough for some people in terms of what we're doing? Uh, and, and I accept that criticism, but I, w I don't think it's reasonable to kind of say we exist outside of a space where we're under scrutiny and where we have, you know, very significant legal obligations in, in, in many cases in multiple jurisdictions. Lee, but you're Rich shaking your head. Yeah, but Richard, <laughs> only when you're pushed to the wall do you get reactions from, go from companies. Yeah, I mean, if we're talking about just a general discussion about going forward to implementing, actually doing some pragmatic work towards uh, implementing a, a, a soft policy document, then where does that dialogue happen? Because unless there's something legal, something which actually leads to a penalty, when your back's to the wall, that's when things and happen. Uh, again, the, the steps before then. Let me just correct. So the steps before then are not newsworthy. I mean, I mean, honestly, that, that's our experience. Mm. We were, we've been engaging with the Irish Data Protection Commission for a couple of years. We're talking to them, uh, uh, but that's not newsworthy. When there's a complaint and it becomes a big deal, it's newsworthy. But again, I, th I think it's but incorrect to say that all this other stuff isn't happening. Mm -hmm. and, and that's not just for us, it's every other company in the room. They're engaging with their regulators on a daily basis, but you only hear about it when it's a crisis. Yeah, but it's at your discretion. I have a question no, at, no. The, uh, at the back. Uh, can we get a microphone to that lady, please? Thank you. Um, my name is Afra Nasser. I'm from Yemen, but I'm living in Sweden. I'm a blogger and a journalist. Uh, you raised the point about uh, making internet as a human right, and my question is uh, uh, to anyone from the panelists: Do you think that security is more important than making that that human right, uh, the internet, to become a human right? Uh, do you think that security could be the main priority before before talking about internet being uh, a right? Security should be the the human right first. I'm going to ask you, Anja Kovac, if you'd mm. like to, to respond to that. In particular, uh, we're aware that, that there are proposals from some governments to, that there should be a culture of security with mm. the internet. And so, you know, some governments have really laid their cards on the table and saying, for us, security is much more important than anything else. Mm. What's happening? Um, how is this going to be resolved in your estimation? Um, how it's going to be resolved, I'm not sure. But I do think, uh, first of all, I think we make a mistake by saying, is, or even asking, is one more important than the other? Security is tied into human rights, right? If I step out of my house and there's a bomb blast and I die, that's affecting a human right. So it's, it's not an either or issue. But I do think at the moment the debate has become extremely polarized and it's partly because it's true, I think we have to admit that, that a lot of human rights defenders aren't that familiar with the details of the security debates and how the technology works. And I think a lot of governments also use that um, to create a kind of national debate about how threatening all these things are, take a whole lot of measures which do not necessarily actually uh, um, uh, benefit security all that much. Um, and in that sense, end up harming your human rights. So just to give a small example, I was looking at, in India, obviously for us, security is a big issue as well. And bomb blast, I live in Delhi, bomb blasts happen there. It's an issue for me, right? Um, but I was looking at the paper on cybersecurity issued by the most uh, respected think tank on security issues in the country, which works very closely with the government. And they were saying that a lot of the policy is very re re reactive, and actually the proactive things that establish the security of the state in a much more fundamental way, which includes having very clear regulations about how to protect critical infrastructure, that was not in place. And I thought, for me, that was quite an, an eye-opening study because very clearly there were some very basic, crucial measures that weren't taken, but we do have a whole lot of surveillance measures that are implemented and also used for other things in the name of security. So I think the thing is really to question the debate, what exactly is at stake, and then ask at every step along the way, is this the solution to this problem? And part of it goes back to the question that we had over there about these rather siloed yeah. conversations, is that the security people are talking here and the human yeah. rights people are talking there. I suppose it is only really in the Internet Governance Forum at the moment where you get all of those different perspectives mu mushing together. I don't know. No? <laughs> uh, where, where well, John Morrison? Well, if we were talking about the extractive sector, we would be talking about security. Security already is a human right, okay? States can suspend rights under circum certain circumstances 
for, for the greater good, I would say the right to life, um, uh, the prevention of torture, closely associated with, with personal security. These things are discussed by governments and states around the code of conduct for private military security companies, the role of the extractive sector in many unstable parts of the world. Don't think that these conversations don't happen in other places, and yes. they do. And, th and this comes to your, your first point, which is a lot of this thinking, we're, we're sort of wheel reinventing here, aren't a little we, bit, by not yes. looking out of our fish pond. <laughs> There's a, um, a question over there, and uh, I know that everyone's sort of wanting to comment on everything, but if we can just get the, the questions rolling in, we can. Hello. My Hello. name is uh, Thomas from the Swiss uh, government. I have a small uh, comment and, and a question. Um, we've been discussing the distance between governments and citizens and users and civil society and businesses. Um, I think something that we should use are fora like the Internet Governance Forum, Euridic, and national fora that are open to everybody from all stakeholders, from all regions, to come together and discuss, like this conference, but in a more open, more bigger uh, setting that should allow to bring people together and, and, and uh, <clears throat> raise the mutual understanding. That was my comment. The question is, uh, strangely not here, but in many other fora, people talk about codes of conduct, rules of behavior, um, framework of principles, blah, blah, blah. Is, is this something when you talk about how to make businesses or governments or citizens or users responsible, is, is this something that you think is the way forward to not use conventional conventions, but new forms of, let's say, voluntary treaties or, or treaties with maybe naming and shaming functions to get people to agree on some principles. Is this strengthening freedoms or is this rather a threat that this is the entry door for, let's say, more restrictive things that come after that? What is your opinion on, on this thing? Richard Allen from Facebook. Uh, I think we, do, we have a, a speed issue here, um, which is that the technologies that we're developing and deploying, uh, you know, are, are being updated on a daily basis and typically our intergovernmental, well, our, even our national governmental mechanisms work in timescales of years and our intergovernmental ones work in timescales of decades. So I think there is a, a real question now to say, if there are governments, um, and I hope the UK government, for example, would be part of that, who want to sign up to a set of principles which will then govern their responses to uh, situations perhaps like riots uh, and other situations where they may want to take a policy stance, I would be really pleased if they had already signed up to a document that would qualify their response. And I'd be pleased if they and 20 other countries did it. I don't think we need to wait until 150, 160 do it. And so, you so, so see yourselves as having a seat at that table or civil society as well, <laughs> or is this a government-only club? I, 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 think, I, I, mean, I think it becomes forceful when it's uh, adopted by government. This is come back to the sovereignty mm. point. You know, if the, if the UK government adopts a set of principles that govern how it would censor, uh, get access to communications, <laughs> so on and so forth, that, that's the UK government to decide, informed by business and civil society, but it's, it's the UK government's document, uh, and that's what gives it the power. Um, so, so my short answer is, yes, let's not wait until we have full international agreement. Um, let, let's see if uh, you can get people to, to adopt something on a, a voluntary basis. As a citizen, I would love to see that. Right, so this seems to be chiming with the audience, because I've got um, suddenly a lot of people wanting to take the floor. I believe you've been waiting for a long time, and then I've got a couple of questions here from the centre. So what I'm going to do is go one, two, three to all of you, so if we can just line up microphones. Thank you. Buongiorno, uh, I'm Innocenzo Genna. I'm a board member of EuroISPA, uh, the European SP organisation. I'm sympathetic with this idea that internet access uh, should be a human right. But my question is, uh, do you ever uh, analyze all the legal implications of that? Um, if I have a, a, a customer who doesn't want to pay any longer the subscription, should I continue to deliver the service? Or should I be obliged to bring uh, internet uh, to any place, also when it's not uh, economical to me? Or can I, is it impossible to cut uh, this kind of service, even if these people is uh, misusing the service itself? That's very good point. Um, let me just take these other questions. I can see that people are wanting to comment, so think about which ones you want to comment to. Uh, have you got a microphone? Yeah. Yes, please. Okay. I'm Bishaka from Wikimedia, the Wikimedia Foundation, and I actually want to take the conversation on freedom back to where we started yesterday morning, which is the classic concept of freedom of expression. 
And the question I have is actually, I want to point out something that I personally feel is an anomaly in civil society. When we talk of freedom of expression, most of us identify governments as the primary threat to freedom of expression. And of course, that's true. But I also want to point out that increasingly, the websites that we use that are run by businesses tend to restrict freedom of expression mm. through the terms of service, right? Where certain things are identified as being against the website's guidelines. And so that is one layer. And at the second layer, we are asked as users to file complaints when something offends us. And so I feel like at two layers, this is sort of turning us into censors in a way that government censorship is not. Hmm. My question is, <coughs> how can we as civil society understand that the threat to censorship is not just from governments, but also from businesses? What can we do to sort of work against it? And how can we really persuade businesses to be transparent in the actions that they take? For instance, if a site were to take something down, I would like to know, is it because one person complained? Is it because 100,000 people complained? What happened? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Katitza Rodriguez. I'm from the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And I would like to jump a little in the discussion. On the issue of government access to citizens' data, there is no need to um, reinvent the wheel. There are already laws that establish these uh, rules. The problem is whether those rules are actually complying with international human rights standards, whether, for instance, those rules are necessary in a democratic society, is the less intrusive means, is a proportionate measure. And many of those rules are not, in my opinion, for instance, the European Data Retention Directive is just to quote an example. So uh, the discussion we should have is, is not that we don't want the law enforcement to have data at all, because they have to comply with their work. The issue is that for that, for any limitation of the right to privacy, this cannot be da done in just a proportion, in non-proportionate way. They have to be really following these international standards for any limitation of the right to privacy. Um, for companies of what they could do to protect citizens' uh, rights, um, because you are handling so much information, and if the government in any country, I mean, is going uh, and sought for your data, we are asking companies to be tell the users that you are the, their data have been actually sought by them. Um, if you are not able to do so because you are under a gag order, for instance, at least uh, try to challenge that order so they can actually find a lawyer that could represent themselves in the court and whether actually that request is um, uh, make uh, it have um, arguments uh, to put forward. Maybe it's just something that you could easily challenge and you don't need to uh, hand over the data. Thank you, Katitza. Uh, now, can I just ask the panel that we've had three uh, quite diverse but sort of related questions, you know, about where, where if, you, if you're starting to define this as a human right, which, by the way, I didn't see an awful lot of support for in the room, but where does this leave the poor old internet service providers who want to cut off a non-paying customer? What about the role of, of companies as censors when we're looking forward to opportunities and threats? Should we actually be starting to adjust our radar a little bit so that we're, we're also including companies and their acceptable use policies as part of that landscape. So who wants to go first? John? Yeah. Lee? Well, right, I'm on the first one. I mean, again, right to water. Um, companies can disconnect people, even though water is a human right in most jurisdictions. They can also charge for access to water, even though it's a human right. So there's a sophisticated discussion that's still going on around that. And I can't see why that kind of discussion wouldn't happen in terms of access to internet as well. The question from the Swiss government. Um, the Swiss government has some very good experience of state-to-state of -state leadership to which other non-state actors can adhere. The Montreux process on private military security companies is one example of that. And I, I agree that that would be a very interesting way forward here. Thank you. Lee, uh, I think everyone wants to go, so we're going <laughs> no, to... I'll just say quickly that, um, I mean, some countries, um, it's not, uh, I mean, it, it's a legal right to access the internet as part of their universal service obligations. 
So, uh, I mean, there, are, there may be some examples in the room. Um, I, th I think Switzerland, uh, Finland and other countries have that, and I'd, I'd like to know what they think. Um, as regards to Katita's point, I can only share her, her, her concerns. I do think that the rise of the user and the responsibility that responsibility of the user is coming through. So what can the user do? I mean, states have limited capacity, companies, the same thing, and the user is the third party and the third pillar in, the, in this triumvirate. So um, we're doing work at the council to try to connect users to their rights and also to mechanisms, mechanisms which allow them to exercise their rights. The user needs to take control. Pe companies talk about users managing their, controlling their data, taking it out the cloud, moving it over there, but you know, what, effectively, how how how, uh, uh, how how much power do users have to really effectively control their identity and actually do things, seek you know, to challenge, to seek redress? I mean, do they know? I don't think they know. Mm. Sarah McCune. Yeah, on the question of um, the threat to freedom of expression from businesses, I think it's definitely an excellent point that governments are not the sole threat to freedom of expression and individuals and civil society groups. Um, I think the problem with a lot of businesses is there's a gap in understanding of you know what the broader international human rights framework requires and in general what their civic and ethical obligations should be um, with respect to individual users. And I think that's definitely developing. We have groups like the GNI and other initiatives and even individual companies that are taking action on their own to step forward and say we want to be more proactive on privacy rights. Governments can definitely, and freedom of expression, governments can definitely help push that along, um, whether it be through legislation, which would have to be carefully crafted, or, or other just guidance. Um, but I think it is an area that companies are either struggling with or ignoring to a certain extent. And Citizen Lab has done some work on um, web hosting companies in particular and their internet filtration um, ser service providers, um, their operations in places like Syria. And it definitely is of concern. It, it's a significant threat, but perhaps what it really comes down to is the need for one particular individual inside a company to step forward and take initiative on it and claim ownership for making a company more diligent and more proactive. Thank you. Anya Kovac from the Internet Democracy Project. I think uh, uh, to Bishaka's question, I think Sarah's overview was, was perfect. I just wanted to add that uh, I, I think companies actually undermine the work for freedom of expression that uh, um, a activists in different countries do as well. And we recently had a wonderful example in India where uh, the Minister of Communications and Information Technology, uh, it turned out, had been having backdoor conversations with five intermediaries um, and asked them to pre-censor content manually. Um, when that news was leaked by the New York Times, Google issued a statement saying, uh, we take down content if we receive a legal order under rules, et cetera, et cetera, which we quite appreciated. Unfortunately, Facebook issued a statement that more or less said, we don't have any legal content on our platform because we have those complaint systems that already take these things down. And for us who are trying to work to increase the space for freedom of expression, that's not particularly helpful. So um, maybe to the point about uh, the cutting off from the internet, I think that whole issue arises not just if you ask if the internet is a human right. I really like the formulation of the special rapporteur in his report where he says, um, States have a, a, an obligation to defend rights as they are defined already. To be able to do that today, it means they also have to provide access to the internet because those two are intimately linked. So that question goes even then, and I think uh, John's point was correct. You know, water is, is a good uh, um, a comparison. Just one thing I wanted to add there. What I really like about that, that phrasing of the special rapporteur also is that it also makes it illegal though I think to cut off people from the internet on the basis of copyright violations because that would be the same thing as actually throwing somebody out of school because they copied three textbooks in university and that's when you're thrown out of, of university. So I'm, I would like to see anybody in this room who's never copied three books fully cover to cover, <laughs> raise your hand. <laughs> Right. Thank you. Richard Allen, so the accusation there is that you're not particularly helpful. Yeah, so um, 
I'll try. I'll, I'll answer Katita's question uh, more quickly and then come on to that one. Uh, I, I entirely agree. I think the solution for data requests is that every request is made under a uh, human rights compliant law that's been properly tested and is delivered to us. I, I, I was thinking of international agreements actually in the context of future uh, legislation. So existing legislation should absolutely be compliant, but I think we're seeing in various countries of the world now huge pressure for new legislation that goes beyond the existing. People are waking up to the internet uh, and when they're thinking about new legislation as well as the international treaty, I actually think it would be helpful if that government had publicly signed up to something that was a kind of self-denying ordinance uh, that was more specifically around the internet because there are lots of countries are going to be looking at internet data request legislation over the next year or two. So, um, thank you. Because we... Content, oh. Go, oh, do, do you... No, do, so the content, finish your point. Yeah, so <laughs> the, you con the, the content <laughs> questions. So again, again I mean, um, I, for me, what is a miracle is that hundreds of millions of conversations take place every day on our platform uh, as, uh, that, that cause nobody any problem at all. Um, uh, we have a very clear and transparent set of rules about where you can cross a line that is unacceptable for a community, mm -hmm. and it, it is a defined community. Our goal is to maintain that space, and, and so our rules and everything we do is designed to maintain that space as a safe space. Uh, uh, but that does mean that there are things that people can do that then disrupt that community and make that space uh, um, uh, not, not work correctly. Uh, uh, and so we take those necessary actions, and we try, I say, to be transparent. You can go to Facebook dot com slash community standards and see all of our standards. You can search on the interweb and see more detailed standards that were published uh, uh, by somebody unofficially. Uh, uh, and you can see the care that actually goes into those kind of considerations. So it's not, it's not that we're not uh, uh, sensitive to those issues. It was a, you know, the statement that you repeated was a statement of fact that uh, uh, most of the time, our service is self-organizing because people report you know, excessive hate speech and, and that kind of stuff, and it gets removed. And therefore, we think the problem is very small. So what we were saying to the government is don't use a sledgehammer to crack a nut, that the community is working well, so you don't need to come in with heavy-handed legislation. I'm going to... So we failed. Sorry. I'm going to... Thank you. Um, I think what I'd like to do is just give some airtime to our online curators, particularly is that we're now into the last 10 minutes, and so I'd just like your summary of the sort of things that you're seeing on, on the Twitter feed. Uh, when speaking about internet and human rights, uh, I think the, the Twitter feed at least could agree that attacks on internet freedom are to be considered human rights violations. Uh, so this is really an issue both of internet freedom and human rights rather than anything else. So the question from, from the feed is actually how can we really get to the point where we can protect such a relation between the internet freedom and human rights and also within some kind of sane timeline? Okay, thank you. And I have one last question from the audience and then what I'm going to do is ask our panel, each of you, in, in very briefly, just to wrap up, look to the future and tell everybody about the greatest opportunity that you see for internet freedom in the next five to ten years. So thank you, sir, your question. You do. I think it's on its way. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'm Salil Tripathi from the Institute for Human Rights and Business. And I just wanted to pick up on the conversation between Richard and Anya that was just going on. Uh, the one about um, take down requests and what happened in India. And unfortunately, Sunil Abram isn't here. But if he were here, he would have asked this. And that's why I thought I will ask you this. And he said that whenever they, they had, they played a neat little game. They sent a list of take down requests in a lawyerly fashion to large companies that are in the internet space in India, including Facebook, Google, and so on, saying that this is offensive, this is hate speech, this is child porn, and it was random pages and completely like that. And what he says, and his report is available on the web, that companies over complied. The companies went way beyond that they were expected. Suppose there were three requests, the company responded by taking down 30 pages. The question, therefore, I have is, what is the basis on which a Facebook or a Google or a Yahoo decides where its human rights responsibilities lie, when they decide to take away content that is written by somebody else and take on more of an intermediary, intermediary responsibility than they really need to. Because in an ideal world, they should be saying, so-and-so created the content, it's his responsibility. Instead, they are bending over backwards. They are asked to bend, and they are crawling, to use another phrase from Indian politics at one time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right. 
can see that that, that uh, chimed at least with one person in the audience. So <laughs> to wrap up this session, and thank you all for your participation, I sense that there's a lot more questions that we didn't have time to get to, but can I just enforce some optimism here um, <laughs> as we look forward to the next five to ten years? What are you most excited about? What is the greatest opportunity for, for internet openness and freedom? Well, I am a little pessimistic, as you might yeah, have than. gathered. But <laughs> I, I think one thing that I have really appreciated over the past two days and that we need to build on is that I think there is an increasing willingness among people who do still believe that an open, free, global internet is important to look at all those really difficult, sensitive spots also, like the balance between cybersecurity and human rights and, you know, that security is actually a valid... Uh, issue which we have to deal with, that the requests from certain governments to make that an issue perhaps also need to be taken seriously. So I think there is, we're at a, a very important juncture now and I think the, the, the willingness to talk about these things is important and I hope we're really across stakeholders be able to build a stronger global front on these issues and take that forward in a productive way where we will be able to continue to retain that global open free internet we hold dear. Thank you very much. Lee Hibbard? Um, I think that uh, overall for the last day and a half, um, uh, freedom on the internet, although it's undefined, uh, as far as I'm concerned, is quite atypical. It's atypical. It's not something we've had before. Um, and I think it's all about inclusion. So we can't boycott the internet by any means. There's no, it, obviously, there's no silver bullet about uh, regulating this space or working this space out with different actors. We all have limited capacity. So it's, it's something to be shared. Uh, I've had a lot more human rights discussion and questions from the audience over the last day and a half than I expected, because it's internet freedom, not human rights mm. for internet <laughs> freedom. So that's quite encouraging um, that we are aware of the human rights dynamics on the internet. I think the freedom, for me at least, is not a la carte. It's not about something you choose and that you choose to take off the shelf. And freedom for me means also means includes privacy. Cross-border free flow of information also means respect for private life and privacy of that data as it, as, as it flows. But that's, not, that's something which has not really been properly mentioned, I think. Same, at the same time, this atypical space is, is special. Um, I think we should err on the side of freedom, on the side of restraint in terms of any regulation. Uh, you know, perhaps make it regulation should be a measure of last resort. Um, and one, one last point is that I, I think that the individual, the rise of the individual, the power, there's an expanded power of people to share and to, uh, and to voice their concerns. That's the whole point. Um, and I think they have expectations. I think those expe expe expectations are growing and becoming more and more important and people are sitting up and listening. It's em emotional for many people. Hence the riots, hence the uprisings, I think, as well. Um, which brings me to the last point, which is about trust. It's all about trust. I think I've concluded it's about trust. Trust in making the right internet policies, trust in, in protecting and, and making sure human rights is at the center, trust in people to have a, have a role and a voice, um, trust in privacy to work, and trust in security as well, for example. But how do you establish that trust? You know, how do you earn that trust? W with great power comes great responsibility to protect uh, human rights. Thank you very much. John Morrison. I think uh, my thoughts Happy is thoughts, happy remember. Happy thoughts. Well, <laughs> I go back to 1948 then, if Eleanor Roosevelt. She always makes me happy. Um, I think um, she start, the Universal Declaration starts with everyone being free and equal, I mean, equal in freedom and equal in dignity. And we've talked a lot about freedom. Freedom for me only makes sense if you think about it in a human rights way. I, I've never thought of a way about thinking about human freedom that doesn't have human rights at the center of it. We haven't talked much about dignity, though. And I, I find that interesting, that we don't talk about dignity in the context of the internet. And I, I wonder why that is. Um, I might want to reverse my statistic that I started with in a year's time. I might come back in a year and, and say that actually this sector is 70% different from others, <laughs> and there's only 30% that can be learnt. But for whatever the statistic is, um, that 30%, my organisation, we want to break you down the silos. It, yeah. There's a lot of learning out there for that 30% or 40% that could be imported into this discussion. And I hope we see more joining up. So I'm quite optimistic about that bit of it. Thank you very much. Richard Allen. I'm actually... Um, most optimistic about the way in which the internet is becoming more and more deeply embedded into every aspect of our economic lives uh, because that I actually think is the strongest defense when people in government are sitting there and deciding the extent to which they should or shouldn't grant access to the internet the economic questions will will be overriding and I, I was 
thinking of you know, you know saying that shutting down the internet, internet would be as inconceivable as closing down the banks, but that doesn't work in 2012. <laughs> it would have worked a few years ago. Uh, um, but That's to get easy. to the point where it's as inconceivable as turning off water, uh, I think is only going to happen. Uh, it's going to happen naturally because the internet is just so economically important that whatever concerns a government may have, they need to look at all other options than depriving access. Thank you very much, all of you. Uh, oh. Sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Last and certainly not least, Sarah McHugh. Well, I'd like to add that uh, I'm very optimistic about the individual users and their presence online and their persistence in the face of these enormous challenges and threats. People keep on pushing and keep trying to be creative in places like China and Iran and really trying to voice their concerns and get it out there and just keep using the technologies. And it's so hard. I mean, it involves both political elements, legal elements, very technical elements. Uh, and these are challenges that all of us really need to step up to because individuals themselves won't be able to do it on their own. So I think the idea of stewardship in cyberspace and really cultivating uh, a cyber environment that we can all continue to exist in is crucial. And I think individual users are moving forward in that regard and the rest of us need to do so as well. And that's probably a very good place to conclude our, our focus here, which is on the individual user and their, you know, their growing power, their growing role, and, and also the challenges that individuals are facing. We've heard a few stories from this room of individual courage and uh, struggle against uh, real adversity. So um, thank you all, the panel. Thank you, the audience and the online uh, curators as well for um, a very interesting discussion. I'm sure we'd all like to show our appreciation. Thank you.